Welcome to the Knock on Archery podcast, where we bring all archers and bow hunters together from all walks of life with the goal to educate, empower, and inspire you to be better both in the field and on the range. All right, all right. Well, Sean Mouter. Here we are. Might as well pop it. Pop it like it's hot. You got the flaming Joe. I got the cheers. The cheery limeade bomb. The freedom, freedom can. There's to an awesome freaking knock on experience, homeboy. Absolutely. What it's do you quite think? Quite amazing. What do you think? I think it was great. It was uh, more than I expected. Turn that microphone right to you. There you go. All nice. Right. So everybody watching or listening, depending on your uh, podcast preference. This is Sean Mouter, and Sean won a bow raffle that we did through Black Rifles BRCC Gives, which is a nonprofit uh, organization, which is really awesome, given back to a bunch of different communities associated uh, associated with you know veterans, military, first responders, conservationists, et cetera. I probably missed some, but. They're kind of just focusing on anybody in local areas where we're going and, and giving back to some awesome uh, awesome charitable causes, which is really cool. So we did a Java build, which is like just an awesome, probably the most awesome color brown I've ever seen on an NTN. I did two of them. One of them went up for auction for this purpose. The other one I actually was saving for myself because I, I freaking love that color. I ended up giving that one away to a buddy who was doing a lot of awesome music at the events. So, yeah, dude. And now you've changed your strings and your limbs. So, yep. technically, yours is one off one right of, now. One of a kind. It's so, pretty amazing. Dude, go like you have to backtrack. And before we get into who you <clears> are, um, this is so awesome because you're knock on nation person, which is co super cool. But take us back to like how you got that raffle ticket, which is kind of cool. <laughs> and, and it was only one. Yeah, I only bought one ticket. One ticket. One single ticket. And there was people dropping like rolls, right, to get to get tickets. So tell us tell us about what happened. Well, I was at your booth one afternoon, uh, buying a couple shirts and a hat or whatever it was, and. Uh, I went to pay with my card and turns out the iPad or the credit card machine was sitting out in the sunlight. <laughs> so it had overheated yeah. and Sharon was trying to get it to cool down. And, and I waited like five or 10 minutes and, uh, I didn't have enough cash. I had like 20, but I was 20 bucks short, I think. And this dude standing next to me is like, well, how much are you short? I was like, I don't know, like 20. He's like, well, why don't you just Venmo me the money and I'll give you 20 bucks cash. I'm like, well, I don't know. I could do that. And thought about it for a minute. I'm like, nah, that's all right. I'm going to come back anyway, going back to the hotel now, and I'll just come back later and, and pay for it. Right. Yep. So that's what I did. I left and I came back like an hour later for the after party and came back to the booth and the credit card machine is working. So I, I paid for it and whatever. We went over to the after party and I was at the table where they had the silent auction going for all the black rifle stuff. Yep. And they were selling these tickets, these raffle tickets for the bow. I'm like, well, right on how much are they 20 bucks and i looked and i still had that 30 bucks in my pocket so i was like well i got 30 so i'll just take one ticket you know <laughs> just one <laughs> wrote my name down and and that was it i couldn't Dude, yeah that's perfect like that's the perfect win right there oh that's it was amazing the, that's the perfect win yeah like both of the both of the auction bows we've had uh you know dependable brendable got the first yeah. one with the you know with the golden trident and now you've got java addiction and both of you guys were just like last minute freaking right ticket scoopers right and kind of went in low too didn't go in really high with like just going all in right trying, trying to uh win the law of and highest ratio i know some people went way in so <laughs> <laughs> yeah there yeah there's a few people that are just like what yeah so i know i always feel bad about those too you know whenever something happens i'm like dang it why didn't i 
freaking <laughs> just say whoever puts the single highest amount in will get like an additional one but i guess right. that's what makes it special though so i guess so yeah so it's kind of hard right but dude okay let's backtrack how you know where are you from what do you do well i grew up in bismarck north dakota and uh then i moved to uh, st paul minnesota in 1998 to work for the railroad and so i've been doing that for the last 23 years or whatever it's been damn dude and, that's uh, that's uh i I turned pro right at the beginning in 98. Really? Yeah. So for me, as soon as I thought 98, I'm like, okay, I started working at Matthews and turned pro like all right at the very, very beginning of 98. Yeah. End of 97. But yeah, 98 was like my first official year where I like considered myself a pro archer and working for a bow company. Yeah. That's Eight, crazy. 18 years old. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I started switching rail cars and you were shooting pro already. So like what's um what was the first task you did cuz you've had to work your way up, right? No, well, I don't know. It wouldn't your seniority gets better, but the job is pretty much the same. Yeah. You know? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. So you get seniority on time off, and yep. that's about it. Better time off, better choice of jobs, you get a little bit more rigid schedule instead of being on call like 24/7. So what's the, uh, what's the, like the daily routine? Uh, 12 hour shifts, you know, uh, 6 AM to 6 PM. And we just build trains, build outbound trains, roll cars together and make blocks. And, uh, then an outbound crew gets on the train and takes them wherever they're going to go. So how many, like, is a train driver? Is that a conductor? No, the engineer. That's an engineer. I mean, kind of, I guess I kind of drive the train because they're all remote control. Yeah. So I wear a chest pack and control the engine and I'm the only one doing it. So it's kind of like driving the train, but Dang. yeah, the over the road stuff is all by a guy sitting up there in the cab. Sturgill said he had a lot of fun with that. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. He really liked it. And then, um, funny enough in park city, I met a guy, gosh, I'm trying to think of his name too. Uh, but he was, um, he was he also worked he worked in Utah with Sturgill. So he came back and he's like, you know, do you still talk to Sturgill at all? And he said, I've been wanting to, you know, talk to him ever since he left. And so I took a picture and sent it to him and Sturgill's like, What? You know, <laughs> he hadn't seen that dude in however long, right. a, de a decade or whatever. So right. I've literally met like three railroad people. In, really? In well, I mean Sturgill was year and a half ago but other than that yeah three in a year and a half is pretty big numbers yeah it's not bad you know what's your daily routine like what's sean mauder do well alarm goes off when if i'm feeling motivated the alarm always goes off at 4 a.m Dang. and uh jocko time right i always see his post 30, like, yeah and you're like 30 minutes late yeah, sucker right <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I'll usually go down and go get some coffee quick, and then I'll go for a short run. And if I'm feeling good, I'll go to the gym. But that only happens maybe twice a week yep. in my work week. Usually, usually work four on, three off. And uh, then I go to work at 6 until 6 p.m., and there's not much time after work, you know. Come home, have dinner, watch TV for like an hour, and start it over again. When do you shoot? Uh, usually after work, and then on my days off. I'll just shoot in the backyard. Mm -hmm. after work um and then on my days off i'll go to a range for sure yeah once or twice so you're pretty much thinking most of my practice time that's legitimate practice time is going to be like i'm off in two days and then i've got three day three good days of shooting yep exactly oh cool yeah, yeah. so when was your first uh when, when when did you get your first bow oh i can't even remember how old i was i was young you know my dad got me started he's been shooting forever and uh, he got me started when I was super young. You know, this was in Bismarck. Yep, exactly. Oh, cool. Um, so the first bow that I remember is I still have it. It's an old Pro Line, and it was a kid's Dang, bow. Dude. Yeah, it had yeah. black limbs at the time. I remember because they were small for kids, and I would shoot. You know, in that we'd go down to the range, and then I'd Early shoot nineties probably. Probably. Yeah. Um, I'd shoot in the garage, and I remember being. Like me and the neighborhood kids would set up like GI Joes and shoot them with arrows oh, and stuff. Oh, yeah, I never did that. Yeah, it was I fun. Want to now, right? 
Um, but yeah, it was, it was great. I've been, I was shooting ever since I can remember, um, probably up until I moved. Maybe I wasn't shooting that much at the time when I moved, like in 98. And then I moved to the Twin Cities and I didn't shoot for a long time then. I really got out of it. Um, I was more interested in going to live music shows and partying. But uh, I remember the, the first modern type bow I bought was a Bowtech Assassin. And I just loved it because it, everything had changed oh, yeah. by that time. You know what I mean? Like everything. So I had that for a few years and it was a great bow. And then I got a, a Matthews Halon and then I got the NTN and it's great. Yeah, it's awesome. Your technique is really, um, it's so rewarding for me because whenever, especially people who say like, yeah, watch everything you do. And then when I see him shoot, I'm like, okay, well, they're not just watching it. They're actually putting it to practice. And I can see so much of how I teach. It, it used to be so rare that I would ever see anyone like built like that, you mm -hmm. know, from a technique point of view. And so most of the time I would have to ask him like, hey, who, who coached you? And it was like super, super rare that it would somehow tailor back to people that I had kind of built my technique around or instruction that I'd got through the years to build my technique. So when I see like for you, I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm just going to focus more on him building his own bow than me having to coach you. And I knew, honestly, I kind of knew within a few shots, like what I was going to be talking to you about. So then I'm just like, well, might as well just let him shoot and enjoy shooting in the range a while. And, and I'll make some changes once he's got his new bow. And I took a few photos and videos like through that process, just because I knew I would talk to you today about them. Right. Um, but yeah, it was really cool just to see your foundation being so solid because you had told me when was it when you literally were like so frustrated you did not ever want to shoot again? Um, it was when I it was when I had that Bowtech and you know, like I was saying, I've been shooting since I was a little kid and I've always been a pretty good shot. And uh one day for whatever reason I just started getting target panic like real bad, you know, and, and it was just, I think a culmination of years of poor form and bad habits that just got way out of control, you know, um, punching the trigger was the main thing, I think. And it got to the point where I'd pull my bow back and it's like, my brain was just having an anxiety attack. And I just, I couldn't, I couldn't slowly pull the trigger. And I started to realize like I was gripping the bow too hard. I was definitely punching the trigger like my finger was off of the trigger altogether mm -hmm. and I was shooting a wrist strap at the time and it would just I'd bring that finger all the way down and then sometimes you know you'd flinch real bad or you think you're gonna hit the trigger and you, you miss completely and it's just it's spiraled. taking full rips at it oh yeah it spiraled way out of control and you awesome. know I tried to tried to and I got that halon and I tried to get myself together and it just wasn't working, you know, and that's when I came across the silverback. Yep. And it's just been, you know, you can watch a, a video that you put out or something a thousand times and you can pick up a lot from it, but you know, is not watching yourself. You just don't know what you're doing wrong. A lot of times and that was what was totally invaluable about this experience is I've worked on my form in my own head for years now. And it's pretty good, you know, but you saw stuff immediately that after hearing you say it, I thought, why didn't I see that before? Why didn't I think mm -hmm. of it, you know? Um, so I, it's, it's come a long way, and I really, really enjoy shooting again. I'm shooting well, and that, that silverback is, is the reason for that. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of it, you know. Yeah, like, that changed it, your life from an archery point of view because you absolutely. pretty much said you were done. Like oh, yeah, I was ready it. to quit, you know, and it just wasn't fun anymore. And I couldn't hit anything. And it was just, I wasn't having any fun with it at all. And uh, you get a silverback and you're in that position and you realize how poor your form is, you know, <laughs> like it, it, it brings out every flaw in your technique that you can imagine. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, and, and just, I, I didn't use any other release. I was like, I'm going to make this work. 
It's not the release's fault. You know, it's not firing differently. It's just my I'm shitty form after yeah, a while. I, yeah. And I figured it out, you know. And I really enjoy using that release. And even now when I go back to a trigger, it's fine for a few shots, but I just, I feel more comfortable with that silverback. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So when did you start bow hunting? When in, I guess in North Dakota, whitetails for sure. Yeah. A lot of ducks and geese. Uh, were there, did you hunt turkeys at all? Did you I shoot never did. Hunt, up there? No, I never really hunted turkeys at all. My dad and my family have done that forever, but I just never got into it. Just deer mainly? Just deer, yep. I mean, we'd go, you know, deer rifle hunting when I was a kid and shoot geese and and whatever else, you know, um, grouse and pheasants and all that kind of stuff. But and when I was a kid with that old bow, I shot one uh, whitetail, and that was the only deer I got until I had that bow tech. And that was probably like... 2011 i'm thinking 2011 or 2012 uh, i got a pretty nice buck with that and then i've been hunting pretty hard ever since then so i really got back into it when i got that bow tech well i i know you shot a bear you've shot yep. a, you shot a look like you had shot a good buck yep um because i had to when i saw who won i was like going through instagram like is this guy on instagram Mm -hmm. And then obviously a lot of times people have the same name or there's multiple ones. So I'm having to like look at everybody. And then with yours, like I went about halfway down and saw you in that knock on COVID mask. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, this is the dude for sure. Right. I should have worn that. <laughs> I know, dude, that might be your profile picture. People will think it's Bane. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was pretty, that was pretty awesome. I had a vision when I saw that mask. <laughs> I, yeah, you studded that thing out. Yep. got it painted. I remember I tagged you in that too. I'm like, "Come on, Dud, let's put him in the store." <laughs> some people thought it was cool, and so I got some hate from that one too. Like, really, you're an idiot, dude! Like, what are you doing? <laughs> Dang, haters. Yep, no freaking boundaries. No. I thought it was legit. <laughs> it was cool looking. So, when you did your bear hunt, where was that? Did you draw a Minnesota tag? No, that was in uh, Manitoba. Okay. Yep. Yep. Can you still hunt in Manitoba for some reason? I feel like something changed there well i mean from what my dad told me you used to be able to just go up there and bait and hunt and now you can't hunt canada without be going through an outfitter going through an allocation right right yep yep what do you think of that oh, i thought it was cool you know it was there's a ton of bears you know yeah it was there's a lot of bears it was yeah. pretty amazing yeah and i was lucky enough to find one like that i mean yeah he was just massive you know so it was fun. It was a super fun hunt. It wasn't very stressful or intense. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's exciting when the bear came in, but it's not like you're hiking around forever, you know? So. Yeah, it's hard because there's so much attention right now being put on, like, hardcore hunts. Mm -hmm. Which, yeah, anything hardcore, listen, if you go to a, you know, if, if I go watch someone good play guitar right now, yeah. I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to be wow, this is awesome if I can pick up a few things from this, you know? And, yeah. and obviously that's like the end goal is to be able to do something on a higher level. But there's also like really important steps in archery that I think are critical for people to take. And it it actually sucks, in my opinion, when people are coming into to bow hunting and they're seeing like people that are, like trophy hunters that are, you know, I'm not shooting anything unless it's under this, or I'm not going to, I'm only going to shoot a seven year old deer. You know, there's like a lot of different things, but I, I, you know, I think it's really important to, um, to hunting like for Sharon and Harry, um, turkey hunting and bear hunting were both like important steps in being a well-rounded bow hunter mm -hmm. because the turkey we were in a blind you're able to communicate like you don't have to worry about you know your voice as much and we're in a blind they're very focused on the decoy and it's a 20 yard shot right so it was um you know it was really a low stress situation you know, you're watching a lot, you're listening a, not, a lot, you know they're coming, you can communicate about, okay, there's a bird coming, this is what's going to happen, it's going to come in and start doing this, and 
go ahead and set your sight on this, get your release in your hand, all like super important stuff for beginners. And then, you know, once they shot turkeys, we moved to hogs. You know, some people are like, I could care less about shooting a hog. Hey, hogs are probably the the best spot and stock tool that bow hunters have at their disposal to be able to go and practice spot and stock. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like 100%. And then if you want to, like right now, we just launched um, the first knock-on like editorial newsletter, which, you know, if anyone listening, make sure you go to the website, knockonarchery.com, and you can actually type in your email to subscribe to the newsletter. The newsletter is going to be very, very focused on content, not, you know, sales initiatives. Uh, we might let you know when new products have come to the market, but it's going to be very, very focused on um, you guys being able to see some behind the scenes videos, um, pictures. We've got a, a gallery for the knock on nation. So all the photos that we took with people at all the TAC events have now been logged into a gallery that you'll get access to as well. Um, and then I did an article, you know, I think 10, th 10 things, you know, for spot and stock hunting. Um, so one of the things that a lot of people miss out on, you know, if they're not into like hogs or even in some cases exotics. So, you know, I was doing some spot and stock, like I was with some beginners teaching them some spot and stock stuff. And we were, um, down at, um, in Texas hunting like, you know, sheep or rams or whatever, core skins, dolls, Texas dolls. And it's so important to be able to, to, to learn those techniques with something that, you know, one, if they bust you, you're going to get another opportunity. Um, but they also have keen enough eyesight they are smart. Like you have to make the right choices. And then if you can successfully do that stuff, spot and stock on, you know, hogs or even some exotics, then it's a very good prep to go out West, which you're, you're getting ready to go uh, out West for mule deer hunting. So, you know, I think even though, like you were saying with your bear hunt, there was, you know, it wasn't like super hardcore and tough. Like, I just want to make sure people understand a hunt doesn't have to be hardcore, super tough, on public land, DIY. Like, those are all things to where as you advance in anything, you should set a goal to be able to accomplish these different accolades. But, like, I just don't like people getting into archery. I know there's so many new people coming in that are like, well, I'm only going to shoot a buck if it's seven or, you know, I'm not going to shoot an elk unless it's 300 or, and it, you know, we got to still remember, Hey, let's just go out and enjoy bow hunting. Yeah. You know, earn those di different accolades and like work your way up. So like for you, um, you know, there's certainly things with that bear hunt that would make you a way better whitetail hunter too. Just, I mean, you know, you were able to be up there. You're probably thinking shot angle oh, a yeah. million times because yeah. of how long a bear will be there in that situation. Yep. So you can really like think about that. You can move around, you know, you can, for me, what I liked when I took uh, Sharon and Harry bear hunting in Alberta was I actually had this like little pointer so I would just like point, I would go like, okay, point to me where you would shoot that shoot right now. You know, I'd kind of whisper and they could just kind of be like being right there. Or I'd take a picture with my phone and then just kind of hold it over and say, okay, tap a dot right where you'd want to put an arrow. And they'd tap, you know, I'd be like, well, that's going to be a little low. We're higher. So, you know. Sure. And it was awesome training. Like yeah. it got to the point where, uh, we would actually, we, when we were practicing for bear hunting, I, I built like, I actually put like a drum out in the yard at 18 yards. I had a bear target there. I put up a tree stand and I had Sharon and Harry get in the tree stand and I actually painted that 
kill zone square on a bear target on yeah. the McKenzie bear target. And so I just say, okay, I'm going to point, tell me where you would shoot at this angle. And all I would do is just rotate the bear to like different positions. And then I would hold my finger down and they'd say left, 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 right there. And all, it was just like perfect teaching. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I don't ever like belittle a style of hunting, you know, or, right, or yeah. not necessarily belittle it, but like, don't think that just because it wasn't, you know, a, a backpack DIY yeah. in Alaska, you know, with no food to start and 50 pounds or less is all you could go with. Like, right. That's in it, probably an end goal. And even when you do it, you might not be like, I want to do this every time. You're probably going to say, yeah, I want to do it once a year. You know, once a year I want to do a hard one, but I yep. also want to like balance some stuff out too. Right. You know? Those, those hunts are great, you know, yeah. and that bear hunt was especially special because it's the first time I'd went. And I remember as a little kid, my dad going bear hunting with his friends up in Canada. And I just thought it was the coolest thing ever, you know, and I always said, I want to go bear hunting with, with you, you know, when oh, I, dang. whenever we can do that. So we got the opportunity and, and we had the time. So we got to go and do a bear hunt together and we both tagged out. It was it was awesome. You know, it was a great uh, bonding experience, and I would. I there's no regrets with that one at all. And uh, as far as the tree tree stand hunting stuff, I've taken a couple deer and a bear from a tree stand, and it's it's fun. There's nothing wrong with it, but spot and stock <laughs> yeah. is definitely what I'm really liking to do. You know, yeah. I I it's just amazing. Like it's it's so much more intense. You know. So have you tr have you tried it yet at all for mule deer? Not muleys, but whitetails, yeah. Spot and stalk whitetail mm -hmm. in North Dakota or, or Minnesota? North Dakota. I really haven't done much uh, hunting in Minnesota. I've lived there for a long time now, but I just always go back to North Dakota. Well, when I hunted um, North Dakota last, I was up by Botno. And... Um, I remember like we actually sat on some stands and mm -hmm. it was like, it was really boring because it was early season and we were sitting stands for a long time. And, you know, you're kind of dealing with freaking mosquitoes and like all that crap. And I remember like, as we were driving from the hunting spot to the hotel where we were staying with this outfitter or whatever he was, um, we're passing all these like, fields of sunflowers that just looked like prime for the picking for and i just said are there aren't there ever any whitetails like in these sunflower fields because we're going into deep timber to hunt and yeah. i'm thinking like if there's deer coming to the sunflowers like let's get in a transition spot and you know and then i also was thinking if i'm in a tree like where stuff's funneling to the sunflowers if I, if something makes it past me and gets out in there and I kind of know where it is, I kind of felt like I could stalk them yeah. in, in the sunflowers. And so I kind of made that comment and the guy's like, yeah, there's, you know, evenings you can see the tops of the racks, like out in these fields, there's a lot. So I just said, well, why don't we do that? So I, we ended up like our whole group ended up going and like, we ended up posting up on the edge of these sunflowers and we actually just sent some people in and just like pushed because- uh -huh. You know, he's like, yeah, they're in there. There's tons of deer in there. And we ended up killing two. One of the velvet bucks in my garage is actually from that hunt. And oh, then really? uh, another buddy of mine that um, actually works for Leupold now, he shot one as well. So we shot like two bucks five minutes apart, like wow. hunting like this. And we had kind of had a junkie hunt to begin with. Yeah. You know? and, and honestly, you know, no, I don't want to say anything to where the outfitter was doing anything improper, but like certain if like early season hunts, they can either totally suck or if you've totally pinpointed something and you've got it like on a pattern, it can be awesome. But, right. But for this situation, there was a lot of us in a fairly small like region and to have five or six animals on a schedule within that kind of a radius was I'm sure not happening. I think, it, you know, we were just in the best guess. 
So this was like a good alternative for, because I think they open September 1 there, don't they? Yeah, right around there, yep. It's like early. Yep. Yeah, because I remember uh, all I was wearing was a bug tamer suit, like, because it was hotter than a mother. <laughs> and there was just so many mosquitoes and flies up there. Yeah. Is it still like that? It, it can get kind of miserable. <laughs> for sure. Well, what was the takeaway? Um I know for you, we you shot your old bow, then you built your new bow for the most part, mm -hmm. um, and then we shot shot more. Uh, we shot three different times, I think, after you built, all in spurts, which is kind of what you have to do. You got because I made a few changes, and you got you know tired fairly quick, which is what I expect. It happens right. every time, <clears throat> so yeah, I was like, okay, you know, we'll. Now that we're shooting, he's going to shoot for 45 minutes, and then, you know, we're going to need to go eat or whatever and have a little yeah. break and then be able to do it again. But what's some of your take takeaways, I guess, both uh, physically from the technique side and then mechanically from, from like, when we did the build? Well, from the technique side, um, the way I was drawing the bow before uh, is one thing you corrected me on. And I was pulling real low and then raising my arm totally up and anchoring. And yep. instead of getting my hand in the position, because I was twisting my hand a lot too. Yep. And, and then you told me, you know, keep your hand in the anchor position basically and pull in that position and then just bring your hand over to your face. Right. Which when you do that uses a totally different group of muscles in your back and shoulder. Yeah. And, uh, I could feel that immediately, you know, and 45 minutes later, I was pretty burnt out, you know, <laughs> it takes a while to, to get used to that. Yeah. And, uh, and I guess just to like give people an idea of what it'd be like, it'd be like if, if you were used to doing seated rows, like seated close grip rows where you're just like pulling like, you know, top of your thumbs right below your chest and you're just sitting there doing seated rows like that versus all of a sudden like me making you stand up and go above your shoulder height on like a you know a cable pull and like actually do a drawing motion where you're up here and you're not like able to kind of pull with your biceps and with your lower lats and your lower part of your back and kind of just squeeze it in like that you're yeah. you're actually utilizing a very specific set of muscles and a smaller group of muscles, which is why, it, you know, you get more fatigued and it seems oh, yeah. harder. However, because the muscle group is smaller, you also move around much. You're much steadier and much faster on target because you've minimized the amount of stuff that's going on. Definitely. And when I keep all that in mind, uh, you know, the other thing was my release was short. I wasn't following through. And after yeah. some coaching on that and just simply thinking of the release differently, not just pulling the hand back, but bringing your elbow back past, like way past where I was bringing it before it, the shot breaks easier. Uh, and just when you have that in your head, that the way you move your arm makes the shot break way better. Yeah. Um, less fatigue, less torque and all, all that. So that, that was this whole experience has been outstanding, you know, and it's been absolutely amazing, all of it. But those things are going to make me a better archer. And that's, that's what I'm after most, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's super cool to be able to, because not many of these people listening are going to have the chance to have you stand right yeah. behind them, you know, and, and critique them like that. And that's, so that was really I do, cool. I do attack. I mean, obviously, right. You know, we, for seven weeks now or whatever it was, um, you know, every single person that said, Hey, can you watch me shoot quick? I'd be like, yeah, absolutely. Let me, let me tell you what I do. Right. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really cool for you and there'll actually be a video out, but probably before this podcast, um, you know, it'll be something, it'll probably be like, um, draw cycle and follow through, you know, it'd be something like how to, you know, proper, you know, or what, how not to draw a bow or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, it'll be something like that, but you'll be able to find it. I'm sure if you're watching, but if you're listening 
to kind of give you a, um, a visualization of what he's talking about. So if you're shooting a handheld release, you know, anyone out there who's shooting any type of handheld release. So when Sean would draw his bow back, he would do what a lot of people do. He'd reach, you know, he'd put his bow to the front. And then as he's pulling, starting to pull back, his pinky would literally turn down to like five or six o'clock and he would just draw like really low in line with his shoulder in line with his pec and then he would bring that whole arm up and so two things were happening one when you turn that pinky down and you're kind of trying to just pull as hard as you can you start to make a little bit more of a fist and the hand rounds off which totally changes your anchor position but you also like build so much tension in your sh and actually my shoulder just snapped if any of you heard that but so you're you've got so much tension in your delts and your bicep and your lower pec and your the bulk of your lats are all pulling this bow and then what you're trying to do essentially is taking this shoulder that has all this tension in it and you're trying to like move it up to where you can get your anchor up. And so that whole shoulder almost is acting like a frozen shoulder in the fact that instead of you having, you know, if you take a fist, your fist of one hand and you put it to the palm of your other hand until your palm cups a little bit, that's kind of a representation of your, your arm and your shoulder socket. And so you want to be able to rotate your arm and that fish should be moving around within that palm and within that socket. And that's what happens if you bring your elbow up and your pinky is at two o'clock. If you're looking forward and that elbow is up level with the shoulder or above the shoulder. And as you're pulling back, then now you're incorporating your rhomboid muscles for that pull and you're letting that you're letting that arm pivot correctly in that shoulder socket as you're starting to draw, not once you're at full draw and everything's so tense to where you're trying to like relocate a frozen shoulder essentially up to your anchor position. So with Sean, I talked to him about, Hey, do not let that pinky turn down to five or six o'clock. I want you to, to have your pinky at two o'clock which is the same shape of his face. And I talked to him about just drawing that back to where you can, when the bow stops, the strings like two inches to the right of your face. And then all you're doing is bringing that elbow over so that that string just comes right to the side of your face. And then as soon as it does that one, you've now transferred your shoulders way more free. It's pivoting. But now once you do bring that hand over to that position, your elbow is following that. And now your elbow is directly behind you. And you've also preloaded the specific part of the rhomboid in the back, which is what you use to, to pull and follow through. So we were able to relieve probably three seconds at least out of your shot process, um, which, you know, if, if, for anyone who thinks about, okay, if I shoot for this amount of time, I get really tired. Well, if you take four or five seconds off every single shot and add it up, um, it, it can really give you a lot more good quality arrows at the end of the day versus taking so long to actually make a shot. So it was nice from an efficiency point of view, but also once we freed up some of the tension in that shoulder system, your follow through then became dynamic, um, which was the second part of what you were saying. So sure. the two of them, even though they're different topics, were related to a very similar subject. You know, and a lot of it was just like how much tension you were putting in that whole shoulder system by drawing the bow low. Definitely. <clears throat> Seems like a lot, lot less tension overall uh, drawing it the way you kind of taught me how to do it yeah we worked on a few things and and your shots were like going off like really fast to begin with and so i kind of told you hey dude you can now because your shots are going easier slow your shot down so that you're not moving so much you know to go off so you're able to 
slow down your speed of your pull, you know, which we actually worked on with like within the first 20 shots or something, 20 mm-hmm. or 30 shots. So you slow, like by that time when I talked to you about taking your tension away from your hand, you know, and we brought your tension way back beyond your elbow and your follow through started happening, you were firing like really easy, you know, yeah. did you remember it was oh, like yeah. practically just going off. So I said, okay, so now don't mash the throttle that hard. Like your shot is easier. So like be more delicate with it to get it to go off so right. that you're not making the front of your sight picture move around a lot. Yep. So you were able to like slow down yet. The shot was still happening faster. Yeah. And just simply having you say, bring your elbow back to my voice instead of me thinking I got to take my hand and move it back to make pull, this shot yeah, break to pull on the string. Harder. Exactly. Yeah. Just that, it's a different mindset and a different movement and the shot breaks way easier when you can wrap your head around that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. What about on the technical side? Um, as far as the bow build, you mean? Yeah. Did, was there any takeaways that you oh, have from well, that? Teaching me how to basically set the bow up and especially tie in peep sights and knock sets, you know, yeah. and after, having to cut it off two or three times <laughs> <laughs> having you fire me a few times and rehire me. But yeah, it was, it was great, you know, to, to get that down. And yeah. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how you tied a peep in before, you know? Um, so yeah, that's, that's extremely valuable. I'll continue to use that, you know? Well, if anyone out there is like, let's say bought a silverback but committed at a 50 to 70 percent level what would you say to them well as far as using it 50 or 70 percent of the time well as far as like if they haven't fully committed like oh because there's a lot of people out there that get it and they try it for a little bit of time and it identifies a few problems yep and then they're just like i don't really know if i like it yeah well it's a hundred percent commitment yeah to be honest it's use it 100 percent of the time and then if you want to see what your flaws are go back to a trigger for 20 30 shots <laughs> and then and then use the silver back again you know yeah like it will it will make you a better archer unquestionably one of the hard things when people do that is sometimes like I don't know. I kind of think about it as like sometimes it's just that one shot that can like make you go back so far, you know? Yeah. And, and it's frustrating when people are like where you're at, where they're like, man, I just, I committed to this freaking thing. And then I started shooting it and I feel like I've never shot better. And, you know, I really think I'm to the point now where I can go back to a trigger and then, they shoot a trigger a few shots and then right away you're looking at them and you're like, Oh no, (laughs) dude. Um, actually a good friend of mine with a long beard, I won't say any names, but he's gone down that road right now where he's, he's, uh, (laughs) he was down the perfect path of having control by giving, giving away control. Then he wanted control back and uh instead of like just committing to not having it now it, he's got it's something else has full control over him he's like he's gone all the way full full circle back to the wrist strap oh really which has full control yeah is it at least a back strap no oh man <laughs> but i mean everybody's got their way and you know what's hard here's what's hard especially for uh like for this person and and honestly a lot of the people that are a lot of the people that are active within our community what's hard is any like anything like that means it's a full commitment of like 
you know what? If you really are struggling by once you have a sight and you're aiming at a target, like you have to put in more time without the target. And then when you finally put the sight on, don't have a target on the, on the bail, just have the sight to where you can just like see the pin and look past the pin and you're still making good shots for a couple of weeks. And then all of a sudden you put a spot up, but it's so big that you can't not like be in it. You know, if you're pointing at the bail, your pin should kind of be on it. And then you just make it a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller. And then you have to then go to the point where it's like, okay, let me try this on an ant, like on a 3d target. Yeah. And instead of like trying to shoot the 12 ring, you're like, if you need to have the mentality of, Hey, if I'm floating around within this replacement core, then just keep doing what I need to do to pull through and make this surprise shot. And then like, once it just gets to the point where you're like, I can be inside that core all day. I have no mental like hiccups. Like I'm totally cool with that. Then start saying, okay, where's the 10 ring and now i'm gonna i want my pin to float anywhere around that 10 ring and i'm just gonna keep pulling and then you kind of just it takes progressions but when when you've got like this event with this company and they're shooting bows and then you're going to that company and you guys are shooting bows and then then you're going to two total archery challenges where you're going to be shooting with a bunch of different groups yeah. and no targets are like easy or gimme targets. It's like every freaking thing there is a stress factor oh, yeah. of some magnitude. And when you're trying to overcome like, you know, anticipating the shot, it's, it's a horrible place to do that because there's a lot of added stress fact, you know, stress factors in there to where, you know, it, it makes it really tough. And that's why when I see people at TAC events and they're like, I'm really battling, you know, target panic and you can see they got a bunch of crushed arrows. It's like, dude, just step up. Like you don't have to, you don't have to try to shoot this skunk from 85 yards or right. whatever the heck it was, right. you know, just go up there and shoot it at 20 and be like, I just want to make a good shot for a while. Like you have to make that commitment to yourself. Otherwise you never like all you ever do is get sight of what a good shot feels like. And you're like, I know that's what a good shot is, but like, and that's just what you're hoping for. You're like, I know how to make a good shot. It what a good shot is. And I hope that I can make one versus like, what'll crush me the most is when I know I make a shitty shot. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, I can make a good shot on, and I did listen, I've shot the, at that sticker at the elk a lot in park city. I never hit it. I never hit that thing. And, and honestly, hardly anyone did. It was uphill that wind coming through that little draw. I could hardly ever predict it. Right. And it was just, it was like frustrating of, you know, what the, yeah, what the heck. But in my opinion, I'm like, listen, I haven't stood here and made a real crummy shot. So if people are here and they're just like looking at me and watch me shoot, I want them to be like, dang, that looked like a good shot. Right. You know, and then when they look down there, oh, you're left. And I can, okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. That's what's fun about tack though. Like you never get that kind of experience anywhere else. Cause first you're dealing with, very difficult shots, steep angles, and then fatigue on yeah. top of it by the time you get to the end. Cause four or five miles. And when I was courses. done with that knock on course, halfway through the knock on course, I'm breathing heavy and I was just, <laughs> I was terribly out of shape, you know? And then you're trying to make a good shot on top of it. And there was some difficult shots there. And then the next weekend, I saw your uh, knock on course and you had one that was like 90 yards or whatever and just, rock behind it so you're breaking narrow <laughs> that was unless the you first make the shot five targets okay yeah yeah so that, i that showed that can... first one and i thought like okay do not do not show these other ones because it was like you know 75 yard uh white tail buck target with just the biggest boulder like right where your air like if you bobbled to where your arrow hit just a little low you're just gonna hit the biggest 
rock. And then because, and honestly, the way the courses were laid out, like they have to get accepted for safety for like the flow of, you know, so you're not shooting at someone else. And so where the knock-on course had to start, it was actually like where an avalanche had came through. So it was just nothing but like literally boulders. Oh. You, you were literally walking through massive, a big rock field. And uh, so then the second shot was a, was a boar target at like 90-something. And, I mean, it's just like a, a small pig target that – literally has nothing but rocks around it and then when you leave that one you go over to a 99 yard doll sheep shot that's like literally bedded in the middle of two big rocks yeah. <laughs> and then uh and then you went to the next shot and because of where it had to be and like the type of rebar we had to like because you pretty much had to nail rebar in through rock cracks yeah so that kind of limits how much weight the stake can take so that ended up being the miniature bear and it was just like peeking over this rock we had to put a, a orange ribbon on its neck so that people could actually see it because in the morning when the shadows were like yeah casting black under all the like no you were like pointing you're like see it right there and and i mean and it was a bomb it was 66 yards yeah and no one could see it you know so and then when you finally clear that freaking boulder field, which is five targets, um, or maybe it was four, and then you finally come over to where I was most of the day, and it was a, a hundred yard elk shot, like on the right on the nuts. And there was two rocks in front of the elk, like I'm not talking small rocks that were like in the grass, but they were like perfectly in line with the vitals. And for whatever reason, it was like, Everyone that showed up with, like, only a 60-yard pin that just said, I'll aim at the top of the antlers, like, every one of those people just, like, centered those first <laughs> rocks. And then the second rock was, like, everybody that had an 80-yard pin, and that was it. And they're like, I'll just hold at the top of his back. And I'd be like, it's not, an, like, that's not enough. No, I'll, I'll be fine. And then I'll send just they hit that rock. But then behind him, there was a huge rock about 10 yards behind him that was like like a rock face, and it was kind of angled to where if anyone shot over its back by about six inches, it would hit that rock behind, and you'd just see the arrow just shoot <laughs> straight up in the air in this canyon. So it was pretty cool, but there was a lot of people, by the time they got to me, they had four like arrow parts in their in their quiver, and you could tell they were just – devastated and i i told him i'm like listen everyone wanted me to set the hardest course i could ever set at snowbird like this is these shots are tough yeah and i mean i lost arrows shooting my own course and it's like move up like it you can move up 100 percent if you're out there and don't have if all you've got is a 60 yard pin and you chose to come to the knock on course <laughs> I mean, there's not a shot under 60 in the first in the first four or five. Yeah. Well, the first six or seven that you wouldn't get under 60 yards. So it's like, yeah, you you need to uh, just step up and tell yourself, make good shots. Like this is making a good shot right now is more important than than sliding back. You know, because in my opinion, if you're struggling with target panic. And I told you this, and I actually worried about this with you too, because you were describing what you were like vividly describing your target panic to me when I said like, you know, what made you shoot a silverback? And then you're like, so I got to the point where like, I, I did not even want to pull a bow back. And you're like, tell me. And then you're like, you know, I went to shoot at my dad's and literally pulled back and like missed the whole thing and shot into the floor and I was just like, oh, God, please don't, like, rekindle some <laughs> freaking target panic fire that's, like, down there. And we're like, what? Uh, because, yeah, sometimes if you're new to getting away from a habit, you know, it's like you know, if you're going to AA, it's like if you work at a bar, it's like it's yeah. going to be tough. Yeah. Oh, I got know? in my head for sure. So, yeah, it was good that 
it was good that you stayed with the silverback long enough. Um, but some people want to go back to the trigger so fast. And I was a, I actually did the same. I wanted to freaking go back to the trigger so bad because I was shooting the most plain and simple looking release aid, like ever known to man, like the, the revenger that I learned that I like had to learn a surprise shot with was just the most basic looking thing you've ever seen. And when like some of the first like trigger releases started coming out with like a hole through them and it's just like these things look freaking awesome and i'm yeah. over here like using this metal toothpick with a hook on it to to like make shots you know so i wanted out of that game so bad and but every time like you said i'd pick it up for like 10 shots and then just kind of be in the fear of like oh no am i gonna have to deal with this again right and luckily over time i could as soon as i switched to the other release i felt fine like that was my safe zone but yeah i told people for a long time you know listen every finger is like a kid you know they all have different personalities they're hmm. all a little bit more sensitive some are a lot more strong-willed um my thumb has a lot of patience my index finger doesn't you know sure you know my index finger is just used to like freaking poking stuff and freaking prying stuff up so when i put a trigger in front of it it just wants to freaking blast it right you know and my thumb is just like okay i'm just gonna kind of wrap around this thing and you know and at that point once it does that you know i just forget about my thumb and start, you know, pulling, getting my elbow pulled behind me until my shot activates. But for the longest time, if I had any type of a trigger that I could manipulate, it didn't work. Like I had to shoot, you know, for me, I learned to shoot a hinge release with the exact same sensation that a silverback gives you the first time you like let off that safety and then all of a sudden you're like, okay, I'm just going to pull a little harder. And then like it goes off and you're like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I haven't felt that before. Right. And until I found a release, you know, until I had a release to where that's all I felt every single shot, like I just could not even touch that release for more. Like as soon as one little tremor went in my brain of like, Oh, make this happen. I'm like, Nope. Got to like run the other way fast. And it would take a while to dig back out. Yeah, definitely. So what's on your bucket list? Um, Archery bucket list. Well, my dream animal is just to get a mature bull elk. Like, that's by far and away the biggest one for me. Yeah, that's up there. Yeah, that would be amazing. So I don't know when that's going to happen. Um, but hopefully someday. They're freaking so awesome. They I are, mean, man. They, they really are cool. I mean, gosh, I'm in the wrong state to allow. Like, I was not going to let elk come rolling in here and stomping down soybean fields. Right. But, man, do I wish they would. I know, exactly. <laughs> so awesome. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, the mule deer tag this year, I hope I can fill that because I've never shot a mule deer. With yeah. My bow, so. They're awesome. so cool, too. They're, like... They're just on a whole different – when someone asks me, do I like mule deer more than whitetail, it's like they're both so different. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's like, I don't know, just totally – everything's totally different. Mm -hmm. I can definitely say that I enjoy hunting black bears spot and stock more than over bait, but I also know that there was like times where – I think over baits like super valuable, you know, someone who's, who wants to go bear hunting, you know, Hey, guess what? You can go on a, a baited hunt. And if you want to be like, can I try to spot and stalk in and see if I can get in and like get a shot without them knowing I'm there or whatever. But the, yeah, there's different levels, but there's definitely not, um, like, even though those two types of things are slightly different, like mule deer, do not relate to whitetail to me at all, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's a lot like, you know, hunting black bears was not any, like to me, it did not seem the same as 
when I hunted like my brown bears, you know, the, the coastal or the grizz, honestly, the coastal bear versus the mountain grizz were two totally different, like vibes. Just I'm sure. Like very, very different. And then white, even with whitetail, I feel like there's, um, I feel like there's different types of whitetail hunts, probably more than I would even explain, but like there's, there's definitely um, like Western whitetail are very different, you know, very limited bedding area. Normally, if you key in on any type of green source, it's like high numbers coming to, you know, almost like elk that would come to a pivot or something. You know, they're coming to alfalfa specifically. You're in like really limited areas for, you know, whereas here in Iowa, you really have to know like, where are they going to bed? Where are they like, where is their comfort area for transition? Where are, where's doe densities? Where's the buck densities? And then, you know, what's going to be the, the thick stuff for the rut, you know, and it's just like totally different. And then you go down to, you know, well, different parts of Texas have like very different vibes too, but you go all the way down South. It's like, you look around and you think, okay, if, you know, there's unbelievable deer in South Texas, right? Like, you know, arguably for antlers, the best anywhere in the world. Right. But wow. y- you would never go down there and just say, well, I'm only going to hunt these out of a tree stand. Cause it's like, okay, well, there's a lot of places you're not going to find a tree stand. Like you could be on a tripod, but then you're on a tripod sitting over the top of cactus. Like, no, it's, that's a different animal and it like requires a different technique to get it like yeah. in that element, you know, just like, you know, trying to hunt axis in Hawaii versus trying to hunt axis in Texas, or I actually hunted axis in Florida too, where they were free roaming by, um, Okeechobee. And all three of those were like totally different hunts, just like completely different, even though it was the same species. The animals act way different. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause they're just adapting to their environment and like, you know, and how they like where their safe areas are or things that they naturally get used to, you know, just totally, totally different, Mm -hmm. but equally awesome in different ways. I'm sure. So elk's on your bucket list. Yeah. What about, um, like for for an archery adventure, you've gone to South Dakota for tack. You said, "Yep." And then you've done Park City. Park City, yep. And did you do another one? You said, "No, I was trying to do Big Sky this year." Okay, my cousin lives in Big Sky, but I went on to buy tickets like a week after they went on sale, and I guess they sold out like immediately. When I went on, they they said sold out, so that did not happen so that's why park city happened but park city was awesome yeah it's a big event you know a lot of vendors and the courses were awesome so how many did you shoot um three of them uh knock on the first day um rmef i think and then which looked cool just for it was cool that would be a good afternoon one yeah i thought it'd be cool like if you shot one course you could finish have a lunch or yeah. something and then go up and then you just shoot 25 elk yep exactly and there was one other two i can't remember which one it was but i did three and we were there for three days was it a short course though was it 15 targets i think loophole or wait was the rmef R- I, yeah. I think that was 15 15 elk I, I think all the others were 25 yeah so that's good that's like a half course yeah that was laid out to be a shorter walk yeah it was for so sure that's like a perfect afternoon finish definitely you know finish vibe yep there were some great courses i wanted to do all of them but just didn't get a chance yeah well there's one day where it was sketchy our course had a kind of a steep spot that was kind of murderous to get up through there and yeah and then once it got wet twice kind of some people were like pissed like hey that wasn't even safe and like i could not control rain like washing the side of the hill away (laughs) right right well the weather was pretty great overall i Mm -hmm. think that first night thursday night there was a a bunch of rain and a storm but better than snowbird from what i heard 
snowbird got some bad weather. And you said your wife is like, at, at first she wasn't interested, but now that she's actually gone to one and walked around, it's like kind of kindled it. Yeah. Yeah. Two years in a row, she's been hiking now. And uh, she's definitely showing an interest in archery now. So I think we're going to get her a bow and next year she'll be shooting. Awesome. Awesome. Well, dude, it was amazing. Hopefully you had fun. I, I had, had fun. Blast. I had fun. Do you like that? Flaming Joe, you said you hadn't had one before it's you great. came here. So good job, Joe. I know it's always weird. Like if someone has it, like he's literally looking, like he's Don looking at can. my face right there. He's all like, <laughs> like with For that sure. face. And then I look, like I see that right there. So like I see that there. Yep. But then I like look at you, and then I'm like looking over there, and I see him. <laughs> <doing that>. He's <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> which yeah which like that face he like that face he actually makes uh a lot yeah <laughs> both those faces he does like that's actually is if he takes pictures with people like that's the face he makes yeah but like that's the picture he makes like right after something cool happens <laughs> and actually awesome. his hands are about the same size as that gorilla's on right. that on that freaking uh canvas right there for sure <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> well sean congratulations dude thank and, you and uh yeah it was awesome watching you shoot it was uh super rewarding just because i can tell how much stuff you watched you know oh, yeah, pre coming sure. here you're making your own arrows which is definitely awesome so yeah. it's so super cool this was an amazing experience and uh thanks to black rifle coffee and thanks to you and thanks to sharon it was awesome hanging out with you guys you know having you cook steaks for me and just being able to hang out and go and shoot and get coaching. It was great. So. Yeah. The knock on nation is like a fun community be, to be part of. You sure know? is. It just keeps growing and uh, just awesome to have the involvement that we have. It's super fun. Yep. Well, I got to say hi to my girl, Lisa and my parents, and I got to give a shout out to my homies in North Dakota listening. Oh, dang. <laughs> yep. Biz Marquis. <laughs> exactly. Shout out. Knock on everybody. Be sure to check out knockonarchery.com for our full line of custom design products as well as free in-depth education and bow hunting entertainment to help you shoot at your best. <laughs>